Tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by the fabulous Paula McLean for a discussion on When the Stars Go Dark, her newest novel, which Kirkus has called a muted yet thrilling multi-layered mystery enriched by keen psychological and emotional insight. Paula is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels Love and Ruin, Circling the Sun, The Paris Wife, and A Ticket to Ride, the memoir Like Family Growing Up in Other People's Houses, and two collections of poetry. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Good Housekeeping, Oh, the Oprah Magazine, Town and Country, The Guardian, The Huffington Post, and elsewhere. She lives in Ohio with her family. Also joining us this evening, we are so excited to welcome publicist and literary agent, Julie Bearer. Julie began her career as a bookseller at Shakespeare and Company, where she discovered the joy of putting books into people's hands. Her first job in publishing was at Sanford J. Greenberger Associates, and she started her own agency, Bear Literary, in 2004. Julie represents a variety of writers across literary spectrum with a special emphasis on fiction. She feels strongly about bringing underrepresented stories to light across race, class, and sexuality, and relishes the opportunity to be challenged and educated by fiction. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming to our virtual stage, Paula McLean and Julie Bear. Yay! <laughs> Yay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I realized that we should have um, called each other before we got dressed. Tonight. Do you think that the people's first question oh, is going to be like, <laughs> did, you, did you coordinate your I think, I think our glasses are the same. I just cut a fringe, right? So I know. Yeah, no, it's yeah. good. I don't you have know, the fabulous earrings. It's just but. hair, right? It's just, it's just hair. It's just hair. I needed a change. I was tired of myself anyway thank you for making time oh my god anytime uh, i'm with so me. excited yeah, to be talking it's so, with you it's so fun and we've actually been talking about doing this event with this store for a while so i'm really glad that it i'm sad that you're not here at bookhampton in person yeah and, like staying at my house and but we'll just um yeah but yeah. we'll do this instead and and hopefully you know when the world stops ending any, any when the second, world stops ending any second now mm -hmm. I like that yeah. um I have a gajillion questions okay I wonder if a good place to start though would be to have you um kick us off with a little bit from your beautiful new novel oh, and yeah would you like some setup for the um for the listeners and the readers um does yeah, what you're gonna I'll read me a little um, yeah 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 Okay. So um, basically the down and dirty plot summary is that Anna Hart, my main character, is a missing persons detective who knows far too much about the dark side of human nature. And in the early 1990s, there's a tragedy in her personal life and she reaches a breaking point. And that's really where the book begins. And at that moment, she leaves everything. She leaves her work her husband, Brendan, she leaves her family and, and flees going to the only place in the world she thinks actually might be able to save her. And that place is Mendocino, California, which is a few hours north of where she's living in San Francisco. And Anna, like me, grew up in foster care. And yet, um, if there's any place that actually represents home to her in the many homes she's lived in, it's this place and she goes there to heal. And, and yet the moment she arrives, literally the first moment she arrives, back in Mendocino, she learns that a local girl has vanished into thin air and kind of despite good sense, despite her own well-being, she becomes hopelessly obsessed with this case. Um, the book also has layers of real missing person cases from the 1990s. So it kind of surfs that line between fact and fiction, like a lot of my work does, my historical novels. And I'm just going to read to give you a flavor for Anna's voice. And you really don't need to know anything except what I've just told you. The novel begins, she reaches this breaking point, and she flees. And this is just the moment she's in her car, basically heading toward Mendocino. 
The air feels like backwater as I leave Santa Rosa and the sun glitters obscenely. Even the unkempt motel parking lot is a garden. Half a dozen has, excuse me, half a dozen silk trees with feathery fuchsia drag queen blooms. There are birds everywhere in the branches, in the smudgeless sky, in the broken neon jack-in-the-box drive through kiosk where three fuzzy chicks stare at me from a nest threaded with drinking straw wrappers, their throats so pink and open it hurts to look at them. I order a large coffee and an egg sandwich I can't eat before cutting over to Route 116, which will thread me through the Russian River Valley to the coast. Jenner is the town there, a postcard more than an actual village. Far below Goat Rock looks like a giant's crude toy ball against the dizzying blue of the Pacific, the sort of magic trick Northern California seems to do in its sleep. In 35 years, I've never left the state or lived anywhere south of Oakland, and yet the beauty still guts me. Stupid, effortless, ridiculous beauty that goes on and on and on. The roller coaster of the Pacific Coast Highway, the sea like a slap of wild color. I pull over and park on a hard little oval of dirt just off the side of the highway, crossing both lanes to stand on a bald place above snarled brush and black sawtooth rocks and bursts of spiky foam. The plunge is dramatic, dizzying. The wind comes at me, thawing every layer of clothing so that I have to hug myself shaking and then my face is wet suddenly, tears coming for the first time in weeks, not about what I've done or not done, not about what I've lost and can never get back, but because there's only one place I can go from here, I realize, one road on the map that means anything to me now, the way back home. For 17 years, I've stayed away from Mendocino, locking up the place inside myself like something too precious to even look at. Right now though, on the edge of this cliff, it feels like the only thing keeping me alive, the only thing that's ever been mine. And if you think about it, most of us have very little choice about what we're going to become or who we're going to love or what place on earth chooses us becoming home. All we can do is go when we're called and pray we'll still be taken in. So. Mm. Oh my God, people, how can you not buy the book after you hear it? I just, I like, you have no heart or soul if you don't go. <laughs> I have to say um, you're a little, you know, a little. Um, don't say I'm biased. Oh. You know, every time I hear you read that part, it reminds me that um, for you, place is a, is a character. I mean, and this has really been true in all your books, right? Paris, yeah. Africa. Cuba, Cuba, Spain, right. California. Right. They, where you set these novels and how these characters are physically part of the landscape they're in is so much a part of the story for you. Yeah. Do you think about that intentionally when you start to write the story or does that come out as you're writing? It's really interesting. I think I've learned that about myself over time. And it, it was pointed out to me by a reader. This was, I was on tour for Circling the Sun and um, which is set in Colonial Kenya. And a woman stood up during the Q&A after the event and she said, okay, I just have one question. Where are you taking us next? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Not who are you writing about next? But where are you taking us next? And after I laughed, I thought that's really kind of astute because yes, I have to. I I, I don't know. Maybe it's the kind of reader I was when I was a kid. Huh. The kind of reader I was when I was a kid is exactly the kind of writer I am now. Like in a way, there's been no progress. The <laughs> I read just full tilts, like over the edge, like trying to disappear mm -hmm. in the world of a story. And then that's what you do. You create and that's exactly a what world I do. I sort can. of I say sometimes that I'm putting on the world of a book like Harry Potter puts on the invisibility cloak. 
And that's a good line. And honestly, it's kinetic when I'm, when something's working for me, if, first of all, if I can't imagine a place, then I can't send the reader there. I can't make you believe you're there. I can't do it with enough, enough depth and dimension and, and, you know, concrete detail so that you can feel your way into that experience. But how different is it doing that when you actually haven't been there versus <laughs> a place like California where you, so Paris, you Paris, be Paris, Paris what? No, no, no. You would be surprised how little that changes when I wrote The Paris Wife, which you know, but maybe not everybody knows, I had never been to Paris, nor could I afford to go to Paris because I was flat broke and, you know, writing my face off in a, in a coffee shop in, in Cleveland. And, and that level of dreaming my way there and reading everything I could about 1920s Paris and all of Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Pound and Gertrude Stein and all of that, it was like a magic carpet ride. It just projected me into that world so viscerally and profoundly. Honestly, I think it's why I wrote the book so fast. It's why I think I um, kind of never got over that book. <laughs> <laughs> but is it different to write a book from a place like California that is so per that you're so personally connected is it different? to? Um, you know, I have to say it was maybe the act of kind of climbing inside. That's what I do. I sort of climb inside the world. And it's why all my books are in the first person. I climb inside a body and I look out through my character's eyes and I see the world as she's seeing it. Um, but for California, this time I have to say it was a pure pleasure because I haven't lived there since my 20s. And so it was like a love letter. The whole book was like a love letter to California. And oh, who doesn't want to go to Paris? True. But for me, just to be able to live in the world in Northern California for the time that I was writing the book was really amazing and restorative. I miss, I miss home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot that's different. I mean, there's so many of the same themes you touch on through all your books. But there's a lot that's different about this book than your last three books. This is a departure away from the historical fiction that you had been writing. Right. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about what taking, what, what was liberating maybe about that departure and what was yeah. terrifying about taking that departure. Right. Well, you know that it wasn't conscious, that I, you know, wasn't sitting around thinking, I need to make a change. You know, I'm tired of writing these historicals. You know, I was in the middle of writing Love and Ruins. So I was in the voice of Martha Gellhorn. I was in Spain in 1937, you know, surrounded on three sides by Franco's army. Like that was where I was when I went on a dog walk one day. And then this character and a heart just sort of came blasting at me through the sky, which is kind of how ideas work. It's very mysterious, the imagination. And so we can have these ideas, right? Uh, but we get to decide what to do with them. So mm -hmm. I remember telling you, I have this crazy idea. <laughs> and you're like, I love it. Now finish your book. <laughs> Stop cheating um, on the novel you're writing. With another novel. <laughs> um, but I really need to thank you because you, you could have told me when I said, listen, I have this crazy idea. You could have told me, yeah, no, I don't think <laughs> you can do that. I don't think that sounds like- I've I know never you, heard, I mean- You would never do that. But you know, some, some people would. And in fact, sometimes it can be dangerous to speak our deepest wishes out loud to the people we love because they might be trying to protect us, right? Yeah. Right. You know, stay in your lane, do what you're doing and, and uh, maybe later or, but really you just said, go for it. And, and so. Well, I what you it. told me about it was so compelling and exciting. And that was before you'd really figure yeah. much of. Before uh, I'd figured much of it out because a lot yeah. of that figuring it out takes place in the writing. So I just started with the character 
I had this idea that um, whatever it was that was happening in her personal life, this tragedy that sort of propels her into the plot line has everything to do with how she makes contact with and is connected to the victim. That the victim mm -hmm. was not going to be um, a thumbnail. This was going to be a full-blown character and that this intimacy that they share, even though they've never met, is something that's profound and it's yeah. because of their background. So Anna grew up in foster care. She learns the victim, Cameron Curtis, was adopted and it's kind of a big leap that she makes saying, maybe I know something about this girl because I know about displacement right. and chaos and uncertainty and confusion. I know what happens when the, the fabric of your family life gets ripped out from underneath you and when your name is changed in an instant and your siblings are taken from you and all of this. So they share this emotional DNA and, right. and they both share that with me. So right. I so, to write this book, yeah. That was, so this is, I mean, yeah. in many ways, it's different from the last three books. You always put a lot of your yourself and your energy into your books, yeah. but you've been sort of hemmed in, in a way by these real, women mm -hmm. and their yeah. real lives. This is not a real person, but you brought a lot of your own real life yeah. lived to her. And what was that like? It was a great surprise to me because as you say, it's the first time in a dozen years I've had carte blanche to <laughs> write a completely made up character. And I really, really enjoy that deep dive that I do into biography to find out sort of what's the untold, unseen, unshown, what's the bit of this person's life we don't know that maybe they don't even, they don't like to talk about, about right, right. And sort of all that to draw out and to make that intimate and dramatic and all of that is a pleasure. So here it is like, okay, I can write any character in any moment in time and anything can happen. And strangely, what I learned as I got deeper and deeper into the book was that here I had this blank slate and that Anna was a character I could give all of my obsessions, like everything that I think about and read about and care about, um, I could make her care about those things too. And, and one of those things is is trauma, sort of particularly developmental trauma, what happens in childhood, how we try to um, make peace with the burdens of the past. What does it mean to heal? Can we actually do that from severe trauma? How do we, can we save ourselves? Can we transform our lives? And then if we can, how? Sort of all those questions. And so I had Anna think about all those Explore questions those too. And it really gave me a bigger canvas to explore some of those. Did it feel more vulnerable, this book, than other books, mm -hmm. knowing that that piece was so personal? Well, because I did it a little at a time, it's like layers of paint on a canvas. Mm. It wasn't until the last draft, I had written four drafts before I kind of peeled off that last layer of tape right, or right, right. Yeah. veiling. And I, early drafts, um, these characters happen. Eden, who in the book are Anna's foster parents, um, in early drafts, they were her grandparents. <laughs> and I realized, in fact, a friend who's a writer pointed out, like, listen, you've been to, in the book, you're telling the story about your yes, yes. childhood. So why not kind of do it more directly? Yeah. And I realized it was an opportunity for me to kind of step, step more fully into that space. And yes, it's vulnerable, but it's also really important, I think, to sometimes connect the dots more overtly and to speak to a story maybe that um, people don't like to talk about or isn't talked about a lot like there are, um, you know, the, the trauma that um, informs Anna's life and the victim Cam Cameron Curtis's life. These are sometimes difficult, it's difficult material, but if we don't 
speak it out loud, then we can't sort of open. It's one of the things literature can do, right? Is can yeah. show make us, us feel seen and make us exactly. make our, our most intimate or personal right. or scariest experience, exactly. recognize that other people have been through it and then we're not so alone. Exactly. And this is something that's happened in the book, which, you know, since it's been published, which has made me feel really validated and, and sure that it was yeah. the right thing. I was going to ask you about that, mm-hmm. what it has felt like. I mean, you wrote um, an incredible model love essay about your childhood um, and and what you've been through and what you carry with you and what you're working through. Mm-hmm. Um, what has it been like to sort of put all that out there in such a public way? Mm-hmm. Well, it's both and, right? It's both incredibly terrifying and exposing to do that, to say to, you know, a couple million people, like this is my experience and, and, I got a thousand letters, you know, yeah. sort of a louder, more um, deeper, more emotional response to that piece than probably anything I've ever written before. And some of it was me too, you know, yeah. I too experienced abuse as a child. Um, and I felt so honored, honestly, to yeah. be receiving those letters. But a lot of them said, listen, I don't see myself much in essays Mm. in novels and it's and it's and it took my breath away and this is makes me feel less alone right so there was a great line from your wonderful new york times book review which (laughs) which maybe is framed on my wall maybe it's you (laughs) um a book full of darkness lands with a message of hope. I'm curious how important you feel hope is and what that played in telling this challenging, difficult story of, yeah. of trauma yeah, yeah, and yeah. sadness and loss. I think it's incredibly important to me. Actually, hope is the engine that pulls us through all of the book and there's a tremendous amount of urgency in Anna's search for these this girl because she believes she's lost all of her chances Mm -hmm. and this is she's basically surrendering surrendering to this is sort of my last opportunity to do anything good and the way that she gets entangled with Cameron Curtis is obsessive it's not good for her and yet yeah and yet it's also how she realizes in a painful way that this is her life's purpose Mm -hmm. that she was put on this earth to do this difficult work and like it or not she has the tools to do this difficult work Mm -hmm. and it's not really until she throws everything out and really commits to saving another that she in fact has an opportunity to save herself and this is what I actually believe you know this is what I believe and I believe that we can be led through trauma to our life's purpose I believe that I was led through trauma to my life's purpose that the the scared um little kid I was falling into the world of books, putting on stories like Harry Potter's invisibility cloaks, kind of looking for escape. I was building a writer. And the sensitivity that I was growing and the empathy and really the power of the imagination to transcend anything. That's that's some big ass magic right there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm so glad you just led us to magic in my next question, which is, ah. can you talk, there's such, I just, there's like an electric spirituality. I don't know what the word is. There's something in the book that is, that is Matt, there's like a little sprinkling. Yeah, there is um, a little sprinkling. The, the and veil, you know, right? Opens a little bit. Yeah. And so one of the characters, um, Tally Hollander is her name and she is a psychic medium and she is introduced to the storyline because she has a vision about the missing girl and Anna in the story is not 
a believer, basically um, is deeply skeptical. And we're not sure whether or not this is a hoax, if she's come some sort of a, this is a shell game, if she wants attention or money. And, and in the end, the, ta the Tally Hollander character doesn't reveal any major points of the story to us. It's not like she sort of- Falls the crime, to right. That, mm. She becomes a kind of arrow for Anna to, um, she's more like a therapist, to trust herself, to trust that she's drawn here for a reason, to trust the sense that she has, that she has a connection to this girl, to trust this difficult lesson that this work that she's doing is her life's purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I get asked a lot, like, so do you believe in psychics? Is this why you put mm. a psychic in the book? And honestly, I don't know why I put a psychic in the book, except- Because she was meant to be- Because she was meant to be this character She's, came to me, right. the gay characters yeah. come to me. And I just really liked what she opened up in Anna, like all of these, you know, if you say, think of the protagonist in all of these ways that um, the, the secondary characters open or reveal something about them. For instance, there's a dog in the story, this dog Cricket, who Anna meets and again, doesn't want to have anything to do with this dog, but then is made aware that, that this, she needs help and that the dog somehow realizes before she does that she needs a partner <laughs> and that she really needs somebody to count on a physical body who she can absolutely rely on and um, that can warm her up and really kind of resuscitate her, yeah. resuscitate her heart. There, um, one thing that's not different about this book in comparison to other books is that there are some real people, some real history. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that was also a surprise. And um, I love this about a novel, actually. You know, there are writers <laughs> you're, who you're play not, everything You're not as much of a control there. freak as some other writers who are like, I do not like to be surprised while I'm reading the book. <laughs> yeah, I never know what's going to happen. I just sort of jump in and say yes, and then discover along the way. and and in the same way that it was very late in the book that I took off this last layer and, and made the book more autobiographical, early drafts of the book were set in 2016. You know, we're set in current day. I didn't mean to write anything that was um, historical. I really wanted it to be a current novel and yet I kept running into these problems. You know, you saw early drafts of the book. It was like a bunch of Just, FBI agents in a, in a room. It was like procedural and they were talking about blood spatter patterns. It was like an episode of CSI and I felt like a fraud yes. writing it and I wasn't interested. That was yeah. really the problem. And yeah, yeah. And what I wanted to write, which is what I write, is character driven, you know, more thoughtful. And so I decided to set it at random in 1993, I'm like, okay, no internet, no DNA. No cell, no traceable no, cell phone, no internet. Like, no CSI, no laptops, no, no FBI agents in rooms talking about blood spatter patterns. Um, and then the minute I did that, it was already set in Northern California in this town in late September. And so I just moved it. I moved it to 1993 and everything stayed the same. And as I'm working on the second draft of the book and I was trying to deepen Anna's voice and really increase her, just her veracity, sort of like her believability as this person who's lived in the skin, you know, she, these missing kids and her experience. And so I was listening to a podcast where one retired FBI agent was interviewing another. And again, I was just looking for language and concrete detail the way we do. Mm -hmm you know, when we're doing research, just basically throwing rocks down a well and seeing if anything um, makes a <laughs> <I> noise. <know. laughs> right. And suddenly I realize that it's an FBI agent named Eddie Fryer who's being interviewed and he was the lead detective on the Polly Kloss case. Right. 
Right. So Polly Kloss, if you don't remember, was a 12-year-old girl who was kidnapped at knife point from her bedroom while uh, during a slumber party um, in Petaluma, California on October 1st, 1993. And October 1st, 1993 is literally 10 days after my imaginary girl went missing. Right, and then the hair, all the hair. In yes, your arms. 60 oh. miles away. So it's the same geographical area within 10 days. And, you know, they're, they're similar ages. And I just thought, okay, freaky. The universe sometimes just kind of throws up these really, yes. really interesting um, moments. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, there's, I just had to believe from that moment on, like, okay, I don't know exactly how this right. works, um, except I have been doing this for a while, you know, yeah. blending fact and fiction, yeah. working in the historical facts on record. I had never done it about um, with subject matter that was so sensitive. Yeah. And so it became really, really important to me to do it with as much heart and um, caution and and well and and love uh, as possible. And it started to become increasingly important to me that I was writing about real life victims because, you know, here I was writing a story and yet this had happened to this family and, and, uh, and many, many other families, and they couldn't escape it the way I could by closing my resource materials. And so weaving the real names of these victims and their families into the book became a really, um, I did not take it lightly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was really conscious on my part to bring in, um, one review called it truthiness um, and the thing about truthiness the thing about truth it will keep you honest yes it will keep I you mean it's honest. interesting because yeah. it's different I feel like than when in the past we've talked about you know um maybe writing about Hemingway or writing about Martha or any of these sort of larger than life they're almost celebrities right, right. characters that you've written about before they're sort of right. and they've put themselves into the public mm -hmm. intentionally right there still is always like a little bit of that feeling and I always check myself. I always check and double check myself at the door. Like, do I have an agenda? Uh -huh. Is this all done, again, with, with love and respect and right. by giving them dignity? Is there something right. honorable about the way that I'm doing this? I yeah. work really hard never to be exploitive, never to be sensational. Right. right. Um, yeah, and so the coolest thing happened, I think I told you this, but maybe I didn't. I don't remember. I got an email through my website from Eddie Fryer's daughter-in-law, who happens to be a writer, who said, oh my God, you've, you've written about Polly Kloss, and I recognize my father-in-law in this book. Oh my God. Shall I put you two in touch? <gasps> yes! So we still, I know, haven't been able to work out a time um, he's very, very involved still in the Polyclass Foundation, even though he's retired and wow. um, really the cornerstone of his life, not just the cornerstone case, oh my gosh. a pillar in his life. And I sent him a copy of the book and I sent his daughter-in-law a copy of the book and I got a note back um, from him saying how touched he was by the book. And he sent me a, oh. a bona fide FBI coffee cup and I wish I had it here it's like for reals it has <laughs> and everything and I just swooned when I opened it and my yes. 16 year old daughter Finn is across the room when I'm opening it and I'm literally jumping up and down and saying no way no way and she's like what happened and I told her and she's like you know some really cool stuff happens to you I think this is top 10 Oh, so this yes. is, this yes. is top 10. You have an FBI coffee cup. Yes, it's true. Cool stuff. I mean, you went to go see the Finca. Like, nobody oh. wants to see the Finca. 
Yes, I did get to go inside Hemingway's home in Cuba, where people kind of look through the window because it's owned, obviously, by the government. By <laughs> Cuban well, government. Cuba is still, you know, a communist country. But the curator of the museum, when I applied to go, had read The Paris Wife and Spanish and loved it. And so it was sort of like this little... And, and, you know, these books have given me um, a, really a kind of a magic ticket, yeah. which is interesting because it's not the other way around, right? I was able to go to Paris because I wrote The Paris Wife. Mm -hmm. I was able to go to Africa to follow in the footsteps of Beryl Markham right. because I wrote about Beryl Markham. And, right. you know, so it's very interesting. And of course, you know, who could have told that eight-year-old girl hiding in the bookshelves? Right. That Hang this on, is sister. Your life. Because one day it's going to be really good. You write across every, really every genre. You write, I mean, every medium. You write poetry. You write nonfiction. You write historical fiction. Short stories. You've written suspense. Yeah. I've written screenplays. Yeah. Is, is fiction your favorite? Do you think you will go back to different formats at some point? Do you? I think um, the novel is my form. And the reason it is, is because I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing inside of it. You know how we are both people who rev really high right? So we have all <laughs> this energy and talk a mile a minute. And it's why we scare people when we get together, you know, cackling and talking over each other. And, you know, my kids know I don't sit down when I'm in the house. I'm always yeah. moving and I'm always yeah. talking and I'm always yeah. doing things. And okay. So for people like us, um, sometimes, for instance, a yoga class can maybe not work <laughs> because it's not enough not to take you out of your head in the same yeah. way that writing a poem is not enough to take me out of my head Interesting. because it's like this perfect little it's a little box and I used to write these tiny yeah. terse little 14 line lyric poems and a short story is also a kind of box and it yeah. has a structure and it's you know it's a box that opens and closes you can see the whole thing at once and a novel is right like you can't you put a scene down somewhere and you might spend all day looking for it and you have to trust that it's still there. And <laughs> it's sort of like juggling plates and chainsaws and polar bears. Like, I'm a, that was I'm terrible. I know, it doesn't that sound terrible. I, maybe it's the masochist in me that, that it's might be. that it takes, it takes every single book teaches me how to write it, that it takes kind of everything I am, all of my thoughts and my best ideas, but also a novel is slightly ahead of me. Uh huh. You're chasing it a little bit. You're like, I feel it. I see. I can hear it. It's like, yeah. I gotta get it down. Right. It's just a little. It's like shimmering mm -hmm. ahead of me, and it does start to feel like a novel has its own agenda. <laughs> <laughs> And some days I'm led into the meeting where I get to understand what's on the agenda. And some days. And some days the connection doesn't work. I'm not even in the room. Like, See, I think that would be helpful for people to hear because your writing is so effortless. I mean, it uh, just, when, you know, reading oh, you, you to me is like reading poetry. That way. The, well, the, the lyrics poetry, mm, work is, Thank you. Is thank you. It doesn't line. always feel that way. You know, Hemingway said, you know, there's no, there's no one way to write. Sometimes it feels effortless and sometimes it feels like moving, you know, busting the rocks out, you know, and listening to the charges blast. I sometimes say it's like going through Chicago on your face. I mean, it's just. <laughs> I don't think I days, that. That's mm, hilarious. That's a good one. <laughs> the days it doesn't work. It's just like it's the worst possible thing. But what I live for is the best days, you know, where everything disappears. And it's like that perfect reading experience when I was a kid. It's like everything falls away and, and, and it still works, right? Aren't we yeah. always dying to read that book where it doesn't matter what time Greatest, it yeah. is and it yeah. snags us in immediately. And we are 
um, helpless. Yeah. What do you do on the days when it's not working? Do you go for a walk? Do you make a cup of tea? Do you? I, um, I do it anyway. You know, I, I sit and I look at it anyway. And mm -hmm. part of it is that I don't ever want, I don't want it to let me, to see me sweat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's literally watching you. Like I'm sneaking up. I told a friend once I'm sneaking up on the days riding like a lion in the veldt, you know, like I'm, maybe it doesn't know I'm here. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> no, I just want that. You snorted. I love you so much. I'm so like as if it can't see you and it's yeah. like, I'm going to trick you. <laughs> I, I just want to put in the time. And sometimes I say, you know, writing a novel is um, sitting down every day and loving this thing that mm. comes Doesn't love me. you back. <laughs> and, and then over time, it starts to trust you and it starts to love you back. It's like a new, and then you like become, a cat. You, know, you have this mutual trust and there's the relationship. And, and so I try to touch it every, when I'm working on something and I'm really deep in, I, I try mm -hmm. to, see it every day. I try to visit it mm -hmm. every day and to do a little work every day. And if I don't, then that other day, the next day becomes that much more difficult. I once, yeah. um, uh, and I'm trying to think, oh, Water for Elephants, Sarah Gruen. Mm -hmm. I once did a, um, uh, an interview with Sarah Gruen in Miami for the Miami Book Festival. And she was, we were both talking about this thing and she was, you know, on deadline and, you know, had locked herself in the closet or something because, <laughs> right. because she was in, she was on deadline and she was afraid that if she left the world of the book, it was going to take her days or weeks to get back to in, get back in. Mm -hmm. But life, I mean, you're a mom. Oh, oh, I know. And we, didn't, we lived in a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> And life, I mean, life just keeps showing us that um, anything can happen, yeah. that we're not in control, that uncertainty is just the, the rule and not the yeah. exception. Yeah, which makes it all the more precious to really put our faith in the things that are right in front of us. Oh, hi. Oh, hello. Oh, See, we were just like, we just keep going. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you both. I'm just sitting here taking it all in. Um, but we do have some questions that have rolled in from our audience. Great. Thank you, everyone who is sending questions in. Feel free to continue. Um, uh, Paula, you did touch a bit on your writing process and how it might be a little bit different across these genres that you so beautifully master. Um, are you more of a plotter then? Can you talk a little bit about how, are you more of a drafter? <laughs> how, how does your process exactly work for a novel? I am not a plotter. That would be great if I could be, to save myself some time. No, my process is really intuitive and um, disorganized and, or organic, that's said another that. word, organic. Um, I usually follow a voice, something comes to me like, I started this novel on Beryl Markham, Circling the Sun, the day I had the idea. I hadn't done you the heard research. her voice in your head. Yeah, I heard her voice in my head. I hadn't done the research yet. I didn't even know that both of us had been abandoned by our mothers when we were four years old, that we had this intimate, profound connection. I didn't know that she had met Ernest Hemingway. Like I didn't know anything right. about this woman. It's crazy. So yes, no, not a plotter. And I know people work that way. Amor Tolls famously like yes. plots the book out for years in his head. My friend, Christina Baker Klein has her note card. She knows she does research forever until she knows what her story is. But I'm following like this piece of magic string, you know, and hoping it leads me this, this place. And um, I'm in for the ride, I'm in. I'm all in. Wow. Well, your readers love it. I have a comment here from one of our viewers. It says, Paula never disappoints. Such a joy to read her books. Oh, thank you. I agree. Thank you. Agreed. Um, and another viewer says, I wonder whether Paula will be visiting faculty 
at the Newport MFA again in the spring, I will be a student there. Ah. Oh, I did an event with um, Anne Hood. Oh, I love her, yeah. Do you know Anne Hood, Julie? From Bread Love, yeah. Yes, she's so lovely. And oh, she and I were at um, an artist colony called Yara together years ago and played a lot of hearts. <laughs> I was just at a Yato benefit and the woman who runs it just spoke so fondly of me literally on Saturday night. Oh, like, really? That's Paula. so nice. That's so nice. But um, yeah. And then Anne married Michael Ruhlman, who's a Cleveland boy and a chef. And right. So I did this event with Anne for the Newport MFA program. So will I do it again if Anne asks? And if she makes me <laughs> dinner... Or Michael makes me do. I mean, I think Michael, yes. Yes. I'm sure Anne can cook too. Anne can cook up a storm. Yeah. She's like old school Italian. And oh, nice. They're yeah. always, follow her on Instagram, Julie. They're always cooking something that you just want to die for. All right. All right. Um, so this next question, I so agree with what Julie said earlier about how Paula creates a place for us in her books. Paula, what are you working on now and where are you taking us next? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Great. Mm. Like, where? <laughs> <laughs> I don't exactly. I think I know, but I don't think I'm ready to talk about it because it's really fresh and I'm really superstitious. But I can tell you that this thing that happened when I had this idea and took this great risk to kind of throw myself into this story and learn everything that, you know, it's very humbling, I have to tell you. I had just reached a level of facility in my work in historical where I thought, okay, now I know how to write this kind of book, finally. And then suddenly another idea comes and it's like, oh, back to kindergarten. <laughs> now we have to learn about red herrings and, right, clues yes. and. Yes, um, yeah. But there is something really, I don't know, liberating and rich and rewarding when we realize just how much there is to learn in any given moment yeah. and that even though it's scary, we're going to be better, bigger people, artists, women, yeah. what, what have you, because of it. So that feeling when the ceiling blew off and as terrified as I was, I thought, okay, now something is really happening. Yeah. I just want to keep doing that. So um, whatever it is that's happening next, I'm hoping that it brings as much opportunity for me to grow. Um, as this book did. It really, it really was wild. And thanks for being there all along the way. Julie is my first best perfect reader. And, you know, I don't say that very lightly. So. It's an honor. Really. Um, well, using this intuitive process from start to finish, we have a question here. How long does it take for you to finish a book on average? Forever. Is there, is there an average? <laughs> <laughs> I will say Paula never misses a deadline, ever. I never okay? have. Never, never ever. Have. If she but says she will get it done by Monday, she will get it done well and oh. sometimes I give myself imaginary deadlines because I know a deadline works for me yeah and so it varies I wrote the Paris wife in seven months that was the first draft my first novel took me five years okay Right. And this last book took me probably what was it Julie like two and a half she, I was gonna say two yeah two. Um, I think it depends. I had a lot to learn this time. I had yeah. a lot to learn this time. And when I was working on my first novel, I was, uh, I had three different part-time teaching jobs. I had three kids, like a one-year-old and a three-year-old and a teenager. And my husband worked all the time and I, you know, had an hour a day to write. So if I had an hour a day to write, I was going to take it, but you can't, it's hard to write a novel that way. <laughs> one tiny bit at a time. Yeah, exactly. 
did you find it more difficult to release this particular book into the world with it having such strong emotional ties? Mm. Yeah, I think I had a little more anxiety about the reception and I didn't know if my readers, for instance, were going to follow me or if I had ticked enough boxes for the suspense world. Um, the readers are very particular in that genre. And yeah, there was a lot of fear, but there's always a lot of fear. Once the book leaves your nest and the piece that you can control is over and then it's somebody else's job to take it and sort of you know, whisk it through uh, the process and then it becomes a book in the world. And once that happens, all bets are off, like how it does, how it will live, whether it will make any kind of mark or go gently into that good night. Like we don't have any control over. We can wish and hope and pray and, you know, make voodoo dolls and build bonfires. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's... It's a tough, I have to say, that part maybe people never gets easier. It. That part never, gets, never easier. gets easier. For anybody. Maybe I don't know a know single. It's going to be okay. Right? I don't know a writer, no matter what level of success, no matter how many prizes or bestseller lists or anything. Tell the story, Julia, when you worked for Shakespeare and Company and the first time you were given the task of. Um, oh. I worked for Shakespeare and Company. It was uh, an independent, independent bookstore downtown in Manhattan that I asked to work at because I was spending all my money there. And I was like, do you guys do employee discounts? <laughs> <laughs> and I was so excited. I was like, yeah. and then my boss, he handed me this list. And I was like, okay, what do I do? And he was like, go grab all the books on the list. And I was like, okay. Are we doing like a display? Do you want me to like write little things about them? And he was like, no, we're returning them. And I was like, what now? <laughs> and he was like, well, you know, like that, those huge boxes came in on Tuesday. And I was like, yeah, the new books. And he's like, yeah, well, where, where are they going to go? And I was like, where the old books are? And he's like, yeah, the books that haven't sold. The books. And I was like, no, 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 you, you can't, you're just gonna books on this list, you can't do that. And it was like, I mean, I, I like went into the bathroom and wept. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, what is that, they shoot horses, don't they? It's like, mm -hmm. aren't you, you return books? <laughs> That's like sacrilege. And you know, sometimes with the mass markets, they rip those covers off. It's like, uh, it's literally horrible. Yes. But the amazing thing about an independent bookstore is that people who work there feel that way. And mm -hmm. um, I finally said to him, if I can sell one copy of each book on this list, can we keep one copy? And he was like, be my guest. Did you do and I was like, okay. <laughs> And I just went on, like, onto the floor, and I was like, who needs a book rack? I got a book Mad. rack. <laughs> <laughs> Mad hand-selling skills. I mean, but it's, it's a tough business. Yeah. It's a tough business. And I just felt all of that. Yeah, you did. <laughs> and independent bookstores, you know, felt it this last year more than anybody. Authors felt it this year more than, I mean, I think there's always very confusing stories in the news about, like, oh, it was a great year for buying books, and all these people... Last year, I'd be like, I guess the pandemic's great for book sales, right? Because, like, everybody has nowhere to go, nothing to do. And I was like, first of all, TV is a problem. <laughs> like, there's so much good TV. Second of all, we're all obsessed with the news, so nobody has any real concentration and can't actually read a book. Right. And there's literally no discoverability. So you can't walk into a bookstore and pick a book up and be like, oh, that looks interesting. I think this I'll look good. Some. Turn it over. Look at the flap copy. Yeah. <laughs> For this person before oh I didn't realize that author I like has a new book out no so the books that really did well in the last year and a half were the names that everybody already knew and the book you know the people who are already big and mm -hmm. and the things that felt very safe and secure because so much was so unsecure and unsafe um mm -hmm. and it was just a really you know traumatic year in many ways for everybody but mm -hmm. um yeah. Well, let me ask you this then. Um, we had a listener ask, what's on your bedside table? Um, you know, what's on your bedside table and who, what authors have particularly inspired you maybe 
in general or through this crazy past year and currently? Julie, what's on your bedside table? Oh, um, okay. I, well, I just went on vacation. So I got to read, I read six books, which is very exciting. I took all the apps off my phone. Um, I read The The Magician by Quang Toibin. That's coming in the fall. That was fascinating. It was about Thomas Mann. I did not know anything really about Thomas Mann. I read the new Ruth Ozeki because I just love Ruth Ozeki so much. And I will read anything by her. And I think she's brilliant and amazing. I read Louise Penny, who I think I turned Paula into. Yes, on show. Absolutely. I read her last book. She's just a genius. And I would read anything she wrote. I literally can't remember and or see anything. It's a little stack over there. I read Mexican Gothic. That was super cool. I always try and read something that's a little bit outside my you know, path and is very successful. So I can sort of understand marketplace wise, like this is a horror book. I had a hard time getting into that one. As did I. But I was very interested in what it was doing and, and thinking about why it was working. And yeah, I did have a hard time getting into it. Um, And I read, oh, this amazing book, Paula, you would love this called Light Perpetual by Francis Buford, Spufford, which I bought at Bookhampton right before I went on vacation. Okay. And is I bought it. Debut? It's not a debut. It, it's long listed for the booker. And the premise of this is so you, this is so cool. The premise of it is that um, there are a bunch of children standing in front of a Woolworths, um, World War One in England. There's I can't, there's something in the window that's new. It's like a phonograph or something. And so they're there. There's like six children and they're there with their various families or mothers. Um, when a bomb lands mm-hmm. and everybody dies. Oh, wow. And the novel is what their lives would have been. Oh my God. Oh. Each child's path that never was, but would have been. Interesting. That sounds and it's so good. It's tragic. I do like a I do like a tragedy, I have to say. Yeah. So what's on your uh bedside table, Paula? So lately, you know, I have been reading a lot for blurbs. This unfortunately is not rare for me. Um, my nightstand is usually things I need to read. Um, but at the top of the pile is Therese Fowler's new book, which uh, I think comes out next um, spring. And also this book, which Julie has recommended. <gasps> oh, I'm obsessed with which I know it's an unknown title, unknown <gasps> author. TikTok. No one's heard of it. TikTok, um, you don't stop. Yes, it's fantastic. And so... I thought you might like that. Yeah, it's yes, yes. thank you for that little bit of um, it's beautifully written, even though it's escapist and there's magic in it. And um, Julie turned me on to a book that we both really love mm. um, The Impossible Lives of Greta Wells by Andrew Sean Greer, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his book Less. And it's there's a mm-hmm. similar sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I think we both of us like. I don't know. We like magic, don't we? I, lo- I love magic. I yeah. love magic. And a little romance and some yeah. beautiful writing. Ill-fated lovers. Ill-fated, yes. A little tragedy thrown in, a sprinkling of tragedy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Alice and Bargains. All the good things. <laughs> um, I'm just glancing at the clock and realizing we're already at eight o'clock, I but I, I want to ask one more question before we wrap, if that's okay. okay. What do you hope readers take away from when the stars go dark? Yeah, Um, I think it's this idea. You know, I'm often asked, you know, is writing a novel this personal, a cathartic experience? And I usually say no, like, no, you know, it doesn't, catharsis means that we're writing something out of our system. Mm. And I always believe that we tackle subjects to get closer to them, right? To write them into our systems, to bring them closer to our, to our hearts and to really, to really confront them. But I was listening to this beautiful podcast about, the, about 
tragic theater and about mm -hmm. how now there's a, uh, uh, here's Crowley, by the way. <laughs> and he just jumped up. So there's no choice now, but to say hello and then to drop yeah. him. He's very <laughs> large, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a belly. <laughs> There's, there's Crowley. Um, this beautiful podcast about tragic theater and about the nature of tragic theater and how the point is not catharsis for the players, but catharsis for the audience. Because as soon as we see this dramatic um, exploration of something that seems larger than life, but in fact is life itself, right? This is what you know, the thing about trauma is it's ordinary and extraordinary. It changes our lives and it happens to everybody. Like both of those things are true. And so if someone, even one person reads my book and says, I see myself and I see now how much more is possible and feels that they're not alone, then, then the book will be a success. And that is catharsis, that is release and that brings change. And so I think it's possible to write a book that has a social message and also is a page turner. And I believe now more than ever, if we're not talking and thinking and writing about what's in front of us, the challenges yeah. before us, the important stuff, then, you know, then we're, then it's a gross disservice, both to ourselves and others. There's just too much. There's too much to tackle. There's too much to talk about. There's a lot on our plate right now as a human species. So let's get busy. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect place for us to leave off tonight as much as I don't want to end this. Yeah, this um, been really fun. Thank well, you. Thank Thanks you for hosting us, Julie. You know, it's true. I could talk to you. Forever, I prefer to do that in person. In person. But... Is pasta, but um, until then, <laughs> I love you to death. And thank you so much. Thank you both so and much. Someday I'll come to the an... score and I would love it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And to all of our guests, thank you for joining us. Reminder, When the Stars Go Dark is out and available for purchase by Paula McLean. You can go to bookhampton.com. You can go to rjjulia.com. Or of course, you can always visit us in store. Until next time, happy reading all and have a fantastic night. Thank Good you. Night. Thank Bye. you. Okay.